So I'm here at the Spartan Training Center up in Sedona, Arizona with Hunter Chip Armstrong, someone who has a vast array of knowledge and experience in the martial arts. Um, he's consented to be interviewed, which I really appreciate. And, uh, you know, he's someone who trained with Drager Sensei and uh, has a tremendous amount of uh, experience going back uh, quite a few years. All right. So, uh, Chip, welcome to the Martial Truth. Thanks for coming in. So why don't you tell us about yourself a little bit, how you started, background, the various arts you've trained in? Uh, okay, I started roughly when I was 12 back in Southern California. Um, initially started, this is before the, the popular trend, but there was a gentleman by the name of Ed Parker who was teaching in Pasadena, California. So as a, around 12 years old, I decided I wanted to learn something like that. I had no idea what I was getting into, but I started, spent about not quite a year doing that, and then kind of faded away and came back again uh, to train with Ed Parker's Kempo in about, I guess I was 14 about that time. Okay. So trained there for a bit over a year and a half, did some damage to my knee, had to have some knee surgery. And at that time, the karate as a, as a general interest in the public was, was growing quite a bit. And was, you know, we're seeing uh, Kung Fu series and all these things were popping up and more and more karate dojos and a little bit of Aikido and Taekwondo hadn't quite become popular yet. But I, I switched over to a Japanese style under a man by the name of Takayuki Kubota Sensei. Was, uh, his, his style was called Gosoku Ryu, but essentially it was, it was premised on the, the Shotokan. And he was based out of uh, West Hollywood at that time. And he had dojos in Pasadena and other areas. So I, I switched over to that, did that for the next few years till I graduated from high school. Then I decided uh, to go to college at the University of Hawaii. Okay. And I figured that was the best place to find something closer to Asian, you know, karate. Uh, I trained with a couple of different teachers over there. Uh, I initially started also with the Shotokan group over there, the Karate Association of Hawaii. Uh, at that time, Hawaii had a very, very strong competition team in Shotokan karate, but also various Kempo styles and, you know, various other traditional Hawaiian systems that were popping up, Kempo systems. So I did that for several years. About, let's see, I think I made my first trip to Japan about 69. And that was under the auspices of uh, one of my karate teachers in Hawaii, a man by the name of Kotaka Chuzo, who was Shitoryu. And uh, then as well, well, he was not connected with the Shotokan people, but uh, he had friends among them. So I, I had some influence when I went over to Japan in 69. I was directed primarily to, towards the Osaka area. And I, I trained with uh, some both Osaka and Shitoryu people, which I really wasn't interested in doing. I was looking for what we might call you know, traditional karate. But seems that nobody in Japan had really was <laughs> understood what, what I thought was traditional karate. So I ended up finally finding a small group outside of Osaka uh, called Mihara Ryu that was actually a, an old Osaka style or old Osaka, Okinawan style that didn't do what we commonly consider typical karate kata or you know, kumite or anything like that. It was, it was brought over by a, an Okinawan construction worker who was brought to Japan after the war. And uh, it was a very interesting system. It was basically, let's say, ippon, nihon, sambon type of kumite okay. step punch training. The techniques were all 
uh, unless, unlike, let's say, the step back, block, step forward, punch type of thing, everything done, was done as combination punches. The interesting thing about it was that, in my mind, it struck me as far more combative as when, when two partners stood facing each other, typically in modern karate, the attacker steps back, right. steps into a front stance, then steps forward, does his face punch or shoot on or whatever he's doing. And these guys would start with both standing in a natural stance and the, uh, the attacker would just suddenly flash out with a punch to the face. And there was no preparatory movement. There was no sign, right. signal, or anything right. else. You're just standing there like this. And we went through, you know, a syllabus of, of waza of techniques. So let's say eight for the head, eight for the middle level, eight for the groin level. And all of the techniques were covers and double strikes. So you never just blocked and countered. Right. Everything was with both hands and the feet moving at the same time. So it was very different from my understanding of modern karate. So the way I teach karate yeah. is exactly what you're describing. Right. However, the way I initially learned karate is not what you're describing. In other words, the way I learned it was the same thing. The step back, right. the block, right. the count. Right. Became a police officer, yeah, you realized you get... that's not working, right? right. right? And uh, so basically, like when we train in my dojo, we start facing each other natural and the attacker comes and the, the defender actually moves in. And like right. you're saying, he's trying to hit him as the guy's attacking. Right. You know? right. So it's just interesting that you found that in Japan. Well, it, 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 you know, later on, I, I struck into the field of hoplology, which is a study of human combative behavior. And you'll see this evolution of... Uh, methodologies of instruction of pedagogy in all systems uh, if you're starting as a a system that's really going to fight you fight right. as the system grows and becomes popular it starts you know smoothing out the rough edges and if you're going to maintain an income on teaching people <laughs> fighting techniques but at the same time you're knocking their teeth out and breaking their arms your income's going to be deflated to some degree. So every every modern system we've studied and every system we've looked at that has originated from a truly combative system, if it's maintained its combative intent, it's not making money. And if it is making money, it has not maintained its combative intent. You can't do both. Uh, at the time when I was doing this Mihara view, the seniors in the group, one of the things I noted the first time I was in there, and I, I found them pretty much by accident. Uh, nobody had ever heard of it in their neighborhood, but I, I found them. And all the seniors were missing their front teeth because they didn't pull their punches on the Maizuki. So every time they punch, they punch for the mouth. And the, the second time I showed up, I came in a little bit early and I remember everybody was outside nice little house out in the outskirts of way outside of uh, Osaka and the tree there are about four or five you know fruit trees out in the front garden area and there are about eight people out there and they're all practicing before the regular session started and they were all practicing high front straight punches and I was I walked in and I was watching them practice this wondering why are they punching so high and then one of the seniors sees me and comes over and says oh Armstrong let me check oh yeah your mouth is higher oh. they were practicing literally to punch you to punch me <laughs> and that's how I thought, okay so that's that's how we're playing this game but it was I would say it was as functional as I had seen in in karate whether whether it was close to old Okinawan style or not, at that time I couldn't have told you. It just it was far more combatively oriented than anything else I had seen. I had also trained with a university team during that visit to Japan. I was there about a year. And the university team was a very combatively functional training team too. They didn't do any cop. All they did was spar. Okay. And it was all full contact sparring. And 
at that time, again, this is about 1970, 69, 70, uh, every year in Japan for years, they always had in the university system, Judo, Karate, Shorenji Kenpo, Nippon Kenpo. Every year, there are always two or three lethalities in the training system. Right. And simply because they didn't spend much time pulling their punches. They weren't particularly technically good, right. but they were ready to rumble at any time. So I, uh, I ended up going back to Hawaii because, frankly, I thought the instruction I got in Hawaii was better than what I was seeing in Japan. And on the way, I stopped for a couple of months in Taiwan. So I had an opportunity to go and see some of the Chinese systems that were you know, fairly popular in, in Taiwan. Uh, and you know, so I, at this age, I'm, what, 19, 20, I'm getting a fairly good grasp of what we consider martial arts in America at that time was predominantly Asian, predominantly striking systems. I was familiar with Judo and of course Aikido was raising in popularity. Taekwondo had not yet re reached the heights it's a achieved since then. But it, the, the Japanese martial arts in particular were, were the, the main forms you're seeing around the country mostly. Going back to Hawaii, uh, my interest started turning more and more towards, again, real combat, because it was apparent to me uh, that I, I was in this, the competition world in Hawaii, and you know, I was reasonably good enough to you know, win a tournament or two, but it also struck me that you know, if you, you're, you're sparring with somebody who weighs 260 pounds, and they're basically a street fighter, and you're winning the tournament because you've made an Iponski point on their midsection, which in real life would not do a damn thing. And you've won that match because you got the point. It didn't have much to do with reality. Right? So at the time, fortunately, about 1975, uh, Don Drager was visiting Hawaii on a yearly basis. He was working at uh, the University of Hawaii's East-West Center, and he was doing a, a there was a special program on uh, Asian studies, I guess you'd say. He, he specifically was presenting lectures and seminars on Asian martial arts. And I, I had read all the books he had put out at that time, so uh, I, I had some friends over at the university where I'd gone to school. So I, I went over, introduced myself to him and uh, managed to get along with him really well at first. Yeah, frankly, I thought he was the most important character in martial arts at the time and continued to think that way for decades to come. Uh, the work he was doing was absolutely phenomenal. He was, uh, he was about my height, around 6'1", six, 6'2", six, at that time, weighed about 195 had the, uh, the genetic uh, components to be a world-class bodybuilder or anything else. I mean, just phenomenal athlete uh, and had been writing books on strength conditioning for martial arts for the pre previous 15 years. And also a military veteran. He world was he was a professional Marine, Marine officer. Professional warrior. Uh, he, he, yeah, well, he, He'd, he'd have something to say about that aspect of it. Uh, he was definitely a professional Marine officer. He was, he went in right at the end, of, well, right before World War II started. Uh, he saw a fair amount of action. He was, he was not an infantry officer. He was a communications officer. Okay. But he, he did see action in the South Pacific. Uh, he was a tremendous athlete and then saw action in Korea as well. And then he had been some interesting spots. Uh, military, particularly at that time, was uh, 1956, US military forces were drawn way back because war was over. And he, among others, were riffed out, but prior to, riff meaning the reduction in forces. Right. Uh, prior to that, what was happening is they were scrambling to put fewer officers into fewer positions so that he, he was working as well in 
well, I guess we could say some intelligence positions. So he was seeing stuff around the world that others hadn't gotten to see. But they're definitely an interesting character. He, he retired in Japan in 56. So at that time, he had already been training at the Kodokan. Okay. Uh, he decided he was essentially going to redevelop the field of hoplology. So he started it as part of a, a study group that was working in the Japanese uh, Koburo Kyokai, uh, Kyokai with uh, Ken Kyokai, uh, a research group that was aimed at studying Japanese Kori Ubudu. Okay. And he wanted to expand it to uh, human combative behavior. So he, he started up that group. Yeah, this is over the next 10, 12, 15 years. He actually started doing research in Southeast Asia and around you know, Taiwan, China. Uh, he knew Robert Smith, who was also a fellow Marine who went into a, a three letter intelligence organization of America. And so Smith and he were good friends and did a number of books on the martial arts. Uh, and like I say, I met Gregor in 75, and he was just forming a group in Tokyo called uh, the International Hopological Research Center. Okay. Uh, I was very what, honored to have him invite me to join him and his group when I went back to Japan in about 75, 76. Uh, at that time, his group consisted of uh, Phil Relnick, uh, Dave Hall, uh, a fellow named Larry Berry, who's well known in Aikido, and Mike Skoss, in, both in Shindo Musoryu and a number of other Koryu martial arts. I'm trying to think of somebody else, but it was basically that was the basic group. And we did field research trips. Uh, Shoots from 77, 78, 79, 80 through Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Sri Lanka. Gregor and I went together with Sri Lanka, uh, where we're looking at combative behavior. So, as you might say, my both undergrad and postgrad studies in the field of hoplology, because, you know, basically I was a karate guy, and Gregor had when he was bringing us into the hoplology study was was trying to imprint upon us that combative behavior is not empty hand fighting it's with weapons there's there's not a culture in the world that goes onto the battlefield and says okay you and me do yeah, let, let's gonna let's duke, duke it, it out, out. Yeah. yeah so he had strongly suggested all of us at one point or another get involved with uh armed fighting arts in japan and mainly in Japan, simply because that's where we all were. He, right. he really didn't have a problem with other types of martial arts as long as there were weapons. And so I initially, he introduced me to Tatsumi Dyu, which was at that time the headmaster's man named uh, Kato Takashi Sensei. Uh, and it, it's an old Koryu Sogo Bujutsu, meaning uh, Sogo, meaning it involved all the battlefield weapons. It had kind of restricted itself for the past couple of decades since the end of the war, primarily to swordsmen, Kenjutsu and Ii, or what they called Bato. And when uh, Gregor introduced me to Kato Sensei, he, he explained to Kato Sensei that I was interested only in the weapons and I wasn't interested in doing Kendo, which is what a lot of their people were doing. So. Kato Sensei started bringing back the old waza that hadn't been taught for a while. And so, what happened, Tatsumi had, was kind of reinflating its own system again. It would, they were all their old traditions, just the younger Japanese hadn't been interested in Koryu stuff. So, uh, we started, when I first started training, I was just doing the Bato, the EI. Then we were doing Bato and Kenjutsu. And we'd We'd do that for about an hour and a half, and then half the group would go do kendo. Okay. And I and a few others would, would continue doing the kendo training. 
after about a year, everybody was doing the Kenjutsu training and they'd stopped the Kendo. And then we started bringing back the old Jujutsu techniques and the spear and the Naginata as well. So it, it expanded. It, it, so it was one of those cases rarely that uh, a foreigner actually had a good influence on the, the just because he was showing interest in it. So it was, uh, shoot, that was about 79, 80, 81. And then I went back to the States. Gregor essentially died around that same time period, 81. And at that point, the International Hoplology Research Center kind of had a reformation. He, he was obviously the... Uh, driving force. The, well, he was definitely the driving force. He was the innovator. We really had no idea what the field, when we started, we had no idea what the field was. I had a background in anthropology and Asian studies, but I had, until I worked with him, no organized structure for looking at combative behavior. And that's literally what he was doing at that time, was, was developing a structure of how to understand human combative behavior and actions. So is it safe to say he's looking for the kind of common threads that are going through combat systems the, that is like based on hu the human ability to move at, the, the we're, way humans we're, we're, think? We're just prior to that step because we okay. didn't know that there were going to be common threads. Okay. So yeah, it, it, we, we all have, let's say most of, most of the world probably at that time, our concept of fighting behavior in humans, for one thing, anthropology didn't even want to talk about it, right? right? Uh, another is everybody's mind has been so distorted by the presentation of uh, entertainment media. So the, you know, the early stuff we saw in martial arts, whether it was Bruce Lee's movies or, you know, Kwai Chang King right. and Kung Fu or that sort of thing, we were getting information, but it wasn't necessarily valid right. information. Right. And our concept of our own fist fighting is basically based on, uh, I always have ever since made fun of the fact of, you know, the John Wayne punch in a right. saloon and how often guys would stand there and wait to take the next punch. Right. And, it, and when they did, if it was John Wayne smacking them, they always went down real fast. And I finally, I finally came to the conclusion it was because of the high heel boots. If you get knocked back onto the heel of the boot, you're going down. There's no right. possible way to stay. I mean, there was, there was nothing scientific about anything right. going on right. in those days, right? Uh, and then we slowly start seeing science of martial arts kind of working its way into <laughs> the movie industry so that that was that kind of gave us a contrast because Drager's experience in World War II battlefield and uh, the stuff we were doing in Southeast Asia so when we were looking at to, to go back to your question there about are we looking for commonalities we don't know if there are commonalities okay so what we were looking at specifically we're looking throughout Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Sri Lanka, India eventually as well. We're trying to understand what's the difference between what technology provides us on the battlefield and what, let's say, less technology provides us. So we, we made the conscious decision is that we're at this point in time, we're not capable of understanding let's say the combative behavior behind modern technology, technological warfare. Right. So if we're looking at a fire team of Marines armed with uh, modern automatic weapons, are we gonna see human combative behavior or are we gonna see behaviors that are distorted by the weapon itself? So otherwise, if we're looking at pre-modern weapons, pre-technological weapons, if we're looking at what we refer to as cold weapons, handheld, spear swords, sticks, clubs, bows and arrows, anything that's handheld, hand powered, the entire world has been using that and has been using that for, as we learned on eventually, for over 400,000 years. Well, it's millennia. So it, it's long before anybody would anticipate. So it, we decided we'd specifically look at those cultures that are still maintaining the use and the, uh, the realistic use of weapons that are traditional to all humans. So we are looking at whether India or even China, you can find plenty of people who 
will still use that type of weaponry. Uh, as a former law enforcement, you, you're probably aware that in spite of America's anti-gun claims, one of the most common homicide weapons on a global basis is a farming machete. And nobody acknowledges it, nobody brings it up because it's not done in studies. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't apply to anybody's political, you know, agency of controlling firearms or anything else. So I had a student who was from South America, who was a, briefly a police officer in South America right. before he moved here. And he's training with us and this guy trained pretty serious, yeah. pretty hard. So a little surprised, right, how intense. And then one day he says to us, I'm showing some knife work. And he says, oh, he says, I, I had a guy attack me with a machete. Yeah. And so we looked at him and we're like, oh, what'd you do? He says, oh, I shot him. <laughs> so he, put, drew, he said there was enough distance where he had time to draw yeah. his weapon and shoot him. Yeah. But again, It'll like work. the yeah. machete is, yeah. especially it's, in certain cultures. It's, it's the most common tool you're yes. going to find. It's uh, the easiest. Uh, Africa is notorious for its machete yeah. use. And yeah, you know, it's not the point that the machete is a horrible weapon. It's just that <laughs> if humans have a potential to fight, they're going to use something that's going to be the most efficient, effective means at that particular time and place. And so that's what we were looking for. One of the commonalities we came to initially was everybody uses a weapon. You might see portrayals of empty hand work training in all these societies, but usually they're camouflaged for their weapons. Malaysia has a fairly tight government restriction on the use of weapons training. So does Indonesia, so do most cultures in that regard. On the other hand, it's very difficult for most governmental agencies to restrict people from utilizing bamboo or rattan clubs or sticks or things of that sort. So you'll often see people doing, uh, let's say, rattan training. And they're doing, you know, Eskrima is a particularly good example. We see, you know, really fast, fancy Eskrima training methods. And then actually go over there and go back into the backwoods area. You'll find people, those aren't Eskrima sticks, they're machetes. Right. So it's that commonality is what we started looking at. Uh, it came to a point, the more work we did, because we were working in areas where there's always a transition zone where people are, have the, the opportunity to select between using the, uh, the family heirloom crease or their uncle who's a former cop has a Smith & Wesson somewhere in the back. Now. So they're, they're aware of firearms by all means. And certainly, you know, the firearms violence and combative use has expanded tremendously just in the last 40 years I've been working in this field. So it, it came to a realization eventually long after Drager passed away, but he, he initiated this was, let's first, let's break it down to what would be traditional weapons. We get understanding of the behavior for a knife, spear, sword, club, etc. we understand the, those categories of use and behavior, then we can look at modern military, modern law enforcement, modern criminals, how do they express that behavior in the air of the firearm. So in, in that process of delineating in behaviors, the biggest distinction that Drager and at that early time we worked into was the distinction between what we call civil and martial combative. And this, this is a huge one because everybody's, everybody prefers a term martial arts and you know, everybody's got a distinctly what movie-based opinion what martial <laughs> arts are. But martial specifically refers to in the English language originally referred to military. Right. So martial arts in hoplology refer specifically to battlefield use of weapons. Civil fighting arts, civil combat arts, uh, it has nothing to do with them being less effective or anything else, but it's preferred by, for the civilian use. Yeah. So uh, that includes law enforcement, it includes home and village self-defense, it also includes uh, the criminal use of weapons, which is an important distinction to throw in there because what we found in a lot of Chinese Kung Fu martial arts, uh, a fair amount of Chinese combative systems 
were developed for and by either law enforcement use or by criminal criminality. Use. Yep. And if you think about it in a in a farming society, farming societies usually are hard, intensive labor societies, and the people who have the orientation towards spending time, effort, and energy on learning to use a weapon for combative purposes. There's there's basically only three professions who do that, military, law enforcement, and the bad guys. Right. So it's the average farmer doesn't want to go out and practice martial arts. That's not part of making you know, well, growing rice. I mean, that's like when you look at the, the typical, what they used to say about how Okinawan karate was developed, farm was created. You right. know, we now know that's complete garbage, right. Right? right? And again, common sense. What farmer have you ever seen that has the time that's working his fields right. every day, day in and day out, trying to provide a, a, for his a, family, a, exactly. has the time to develop a martial right. art. Right. So it, it's, it was something that became very apparent. Okinawa is a certain example. Thailand's an example. We, we were familiar with systems like Thai kickboxing. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a civilian system, there's no doubt about it. Most of what we see is the sport version. You look at uh, earlier versions of Thai kickboxing, or you go out into the village versions of the Thai kickboxing, and it's still a civilian system. It's always, there are, there are martial forms, let's say Thai martial arts, right. but they haven't been used since the advent of firearms. There's no reason for anybody to maintain those. There's, the, there's both economic and, let's say, heritage reasons for Thai people to maintain their old empty hand fighting arts. Right. So we'll, we'll see quite a bit of that sort of thing. But when you look at even some of the village fighting systems of the Thais, where they're, they're wearing, uh, they'll wrap the, the wraps with broken glass and glued on to the wraps. And you don't, you don't see old Thai kickboxers in these villages because right. it's a very, very rough thing. And it's just not the same as what the popular sport has become. So what you see is, you know, the ends justifies the means. And in the modern world, no matter where you go, the if there's a economical end to Thai kickboxing or Taekwondo or Karate Do, then it'll be continued to be practiced, but it'll be practiced in a manner that allows that economic end to, to pay out. Martial systems is a totally different thing when you talk about martial systems that meaning designed for and by the battlefield unless a particular nation state has cultural reasons for hanging on to traditional weapons they'll all shift over to modern to fire modern there's not going to be right. any doubt about it so in cases like japan where you still have a code of Bujutsu, that's because the, the, the Japanese culture puts a little bit more emphasis on maintaining heritage than most not so insulated cultures do. Uh, China is a bit different in that regard in that their martial culture, let's say the, the, the Japanese had a warrior culture very late in their historical time period. So the, the samurai, the, the elite of the Japanese society was still extant in the late 1800s. Chinese uh, martial elite as a, a portion of society was eliminated about 2,000 years ago. So there, we have conscript martial systems in China. They're very old, but you don't have many elite systems. And so most of what we see in China is a totally different cultural group than the systems development. So you see more, let's say, uh, systems of Tai Chi Chuan, Xing Yi, general, let's say, uh, uh, we, we talk about uh, Shaolin or Shaolin. Uh, these are for civilians. The guys on the battlefield aren't using these systems. So those, those things tend to be very divergent and they, you know, they can be misinterpreted on what they're for, how they're being used and whatnot. Well, you know, I've been studying Chen style Tai Chi Chuan practical method for about 25 years. I'm an indoor disciple of Chen Zhanghua. And, you know, when he talks about it, he says historically the record goes back about 400 years, right. Chen style. 
He said, uh, you know, he said what made it become people aware of it was uh, same with Bagua, same with Xinyi, is they were hired as bodyguards to protect right. caravans, right. Right? right? And it, going back to your earlier thing, so why are they hired? Because the criminals are using their martial techniques. Right, right. Yeah, so people that, on know, the caravan yeah. maybe don't have access to firearms to protect right. themselves, so they're hiring these martial arts guys. Right. And then again, either those martial arts guys, their techniques are going to be proven effective, or they're going to be killed. So, what was that movie about 10 years ago, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon? Right. That actually presented the whole hypothesis pretty well because it was all about essentially the the, the convoy guards versus right. you know the bad guys. So it, it made, makes total sense. But that's basically, you'll see the exact same kind of thing in India. Okay. So we have Indian martial arts, we have Indian civilian combative systems. Uh, the, we, there's not much maintained in India in either regard, because they also have guns. Right. So, right. but you know, the preferred, you know, if you go to Bombay or, you know, the, the not so nice part of any city in India, you find plenty of guys with knives. Interestingly, you'll find plenty of guys using the rattan pole as well. So, so I did a three city tour in India, yeah. teaching uh, karate. Right. And uh, so I got to see some of the uh, bow work. Right. Because obviously, I, you know, we do, we have bow, Okinawan bow, but obviously the rattan in, in the bow in India is very, very different. Very different. But I found it very fascinating. Right. And sadly, I was supposed to be visiting a Kalarapaya school yeah. while I was there. It fell through. I wasn't able to go see it. I'm hoping the next time I go back, I'll be able to. Kalarapaya is a very interesting that's a wall over there. Is yeah, I saw, I saw yeah. some of the photos over there. Uh, it's technically it's a martial system. Right. It originated as a martial system. It's not particularly old. Uh, none of the, the Indian systems, you know, everybody likes to claim their systems 2,000, 3 years. They're pre-Buddha, right. if you will. But uh, right. Right. Uh, we, we can't find much evidence of anybody maintaining that long. But uh, it is a fairly old system. It was a, it, we finally came to the conclusion it was a heroic dueling system. So if wow. you think of something along the lines of a, uh, what was the movie Troy with, uh, but essentially where they bring out the two heroes right. for each Brad Pitt and Bad Pitt and, and, the, right. and then I forget the other guy, the Eric Bann is the right. actor. Right. right. And they engage so in that. So that was not uncommon, and it was certainly a commonality among the Indian princedoms. Okay. Where the Kalade Payat was specifically a system, it was weapon, it okay. was for the battlefield. But it's not for a unit of men armed with those weapons to face a unit of men armed, armed with those, with those weapons. weapons. Okay. It was for the the he heroic what, champions of each side to fight. Okay. So it was it is particularly interesting in that regard because it's a phenomenal system, very very tough to do, uh, very tough to train in, but it, it's. Uh, let's say it's functional application in the sense of what most people in the West think of as a martial art is pretty limited. Right. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. That's not ever what I'm talking about. It always is up to the individual whether right. a system is going to work, work or not. Right. But it's right. just what it was aimed at was something you're just not going to find those circumstances too frequently in the modern world. So we were looking at these concepts. We divide between martial and civil. Biggest single distinction you have to make 19, uh, shoot, about 98, I was contacted by a U.S. Marine Corps okay. who was on the verge of changing up, again, their close combat training system. And it happened that one of the people involved with you know, making that decision was a, a young Marine Corps major who was a big fan of Don Drager. As uh, a judo man, trained in judo is, and had been to Japan. Uh, he actually contacted me and mainly is trying to find out about Don Drager. And okay. then, uh, then he started telling me about the Marine Corps was thinking about changing their program. Long story short, he came out to visit. We had a long talk, similar to this one. Uh, <laughs> he, he got very interested in the whole field of what we're talking okay. about here. And 
So he then invited me, introduced me to some other you know, senior officers in the Marine Corps, and I got invited to be one of the uh, subject matter experts on the new, what was called Marine Corps Martial Arts Program, McMap. And I spent, shoot, the next, uh, from that time, 99, 2000 to about 2014, working through with either the McMap program or Mac McMap program started getting a little, I guess it started going off in its own direction, which happens in the military. But I started uh, working with various units, infantry units, uh, Marine Corps ra uh, Raiders, or which, uh, recon as well. And so I had tremendous opportunity to kind of test our theory that the combative behaviors we see prior to firearms. At this point, I've concluded personally that that behavior, 400,000 years worth of which, and then 10,000 years of historical, you know, let's say we have recording of human combative behavior. And I'm pretty convinced by now that we're gonna see the same behavior in spite of the, the advent of firearms and modern technology. Behavior is the same. The, Behavior has not evolved beyond, you know, the spear, spear to spear action of Vikings or anybody else along that way. So I started working with the uh, Marine Corps program. I worked with a number of different military combat units through the start of the Iraq War, the Afghan War, and so tremendous opportunities for my perspective, if, if you know, if for all the wrong reasons, and. It, it certainly validated everything we had been looking at, the, the combative behaviors we look at of the martial man, the martial woman, for that matter, uh, are based on, and militaries have been reinventing the process for a couple thousand years, but you know, it's, it's no different. The, the modern Marine Corps, the modern French Foreign Legion, the modern German Bundeswehr, uh, they're following principles that the Romans found, figured out 2,000 years back. Uh, you know, it, it's men in groups working in time together can form a, a, a martial coherence and capability that you can't see in a, any other format. But it, it, it's not, it doesn't really have anything to do with the weapon. It has to do with the men and the behavior behind that. So for the past, since what, 19 or 2015, 2016, what I've been looking at is digging further into how does that apply, whether it's the Japanese martial culture, or the, uh, yeah, we, we've looked into African martial culture, particularly down into the Zulu lands, because you have a, a better organized structure to, to observe it with. But more importantly, for me anyway, I'm now more oriented towards the say the evolutionary basis of our combative behavior and in my opinion this is a huge impact on how we operate today and it, it applies to both our dysfunctionalities but also our, our functionality and it's mainly because we avoid looking at it too closely right uh, anthropology refuses to touch on the topic because it, it's anathema. It's, it's about the bad side of being human, right? It's the dark side of being human. Right. And I would argue quite the opposite. It's because the first, the first pre-modern human was willing to actually figure out how to make a sharp pointy stick. And he decided, uh, and no anthropology, archeology, span bioarchaeology or anything else has come to explain how we decided to go from being a leaf-eating cousin of chimpanzees to a apex predator carnivore. And the only way we could do that, if you think about it, at that time, when we're basically cousins with chimpanzees, we had no other physical attributes, we had none of the ferocity of a, a hyena, a lion, a leopard, we don't have the claws, the teeth, the power, we don't have any of those attributes. The one thing we did, and this huge transition point, is we were able to figure out that if we sharpen uh, a stick, we can actually, you know, probably initially merely uh, scavenge. But the point being there, to be a, a successful scavenger, you're still competing against other scavengers such as leopards and hyenas. And there's nothing that 
would appear to allow us to compete with these very tough animals. Yes. But we not only can't compete with them, we then became hunters. And it wasn't because we wanted to grow wheat in the next valley over, it's right. because we wanted the meat. So that ability to hunt with a weapon, and that's the key thing, it's not a, it's not a tool. And I get into arguments all the time. We'll often hear about man, the tool user. Right. The tool right. did not make us capable of eating meat. It was a weapon, and it's not a type of a weapon. The weapon is a very distinct implement that is used for a very distinct purpose. It's not usable as a cooking pot holder. Right. It's not right. usable for digging up ants. Right. It's it, used it has for one, killing. It has yeah. one purpose. It's one purpose. And, and, you know, people don't you know look at that enough. I think. I mean, man's ability is one: his ability to think, and th being able to think the way he does, his ability to create a tool. And again, we say a tool, but really, what's the first tool? The first right. tool that man uses is a weapon. Right. And again, you know, again, I think the problem with modern society is we look at things through a modern lens too much. And we also, you know, again, we sometimes look at our warrior class, we look down on them, right? They're, they're thugs, they're right. this. Well, that. We, we have that tendency, but that, right. that comes and goes. But right. you're absolutely right. It's the thing that I also throw out here. I get into this discussion fairly often as well. One of the great attributes of, of, of mankind, humankind, is our ability to think. Right. All right. We didn't think before we had the weapon. Right. We had to have the weapon to right. learn how to think. And right. this this is such an, an extremely important distinction. So I've, I've never heard it put that way, but that it, is brilliant. And it, it's, it, nobody's going to agree with it, mind you. Nobody in the anthropology well, that's okay. world. Well, that's okay. It, it is okay. But it's, you know, people come in here and see all this stuff on the wall. I get two responses. Wow, that's really cool. What do you do with all those? Right. Or the other response is they don't see them. Right. It's, right. it's so much easier not to see right. weapons on the wall. And, you know, if they actually are interested, I'll say, well, this is part of your heritage as a human. And that'll generally stop the conversation right off the bat. Right. Now. The good news is, is that people are getting scared enough at this point in time for political reasons that right. you know, more people are thinking that, you know, maybe I should learn how to protect myself. But this is, this is one of the key things we've been doing in the past several years is trying to get the information out that, you know, martial behavior doesn't mean thug behavior. It doesn't mean, you know, inappropriate violence. Essentially, every human being originated from a species that wanted to feed its family, protect its family, save its community, and expand. It didn't start off as criminals or thugs. So, so in New York, yeah. where I'm originally from, right. so, you know, I retired from the NYPD, right. but I'm in the dojo, and my dojo is like my home. Right. So I'd have my firearm on my hip exposed, and a parent would come in and go, but I thought you retired. And I'd look at them and say, well, yeah, I retired, but right. I'm not really retired. Right. Like, I, I can never stop thinking like a police officer. Right. And he goes, well, why do you carry that? I said, well, I carry it because when you're walking to the parking lot with your kid and I see three thugs come up to you, I can go over there and help you. Right. Would you rather me not carry it? And usually the light bulb would go off a little bit yeah. and they'd go, oh, no, no, we'd rather you yeah. carry it, you know? So it's interesting, the modern thought process of... Uh, you it's, know, it, how it, people look at things, it's, you know? We, we are a species that, you know, governments, government authority doesn't like to have competition. And we are a species, though, that's always been armed. There's never been a time when we were right. unarmed. You couldn't, you couldn't survive. Now, that's a very new thing. And in the modern world, of course, we, we've, we've got a lot of uh, misdirection going on in that. But when, let's say, things cause fear at a general low level. Right. That's the first thing people start thinking about again right. is, you know, I don't like guns, but I think we should learn how to use them. And that's fine. You know, once you start making that thought process work, you, you know, you start becoming more reasonable about, well, why don't you like guns? Right. Because the gun in, inherently in itself is not evil. The sword is not evil. Right. You can use it for evil purposes, certainly, as you can with a stick of dynamite or well, you can, you can take else. a pencil, right, right and kill right. someone with it, right? So, so the the point is, we do. You'd probably be surprised at how much weapons training we do. And it's just started really in the last four or five years. Uh, the majority of my members in here, probably seventy-five percent women. Okay. 
most of the workouts we do, the, the workouts, and I distinguish between working out and training. Training is skill on the right, right. Working out is physical conditioning. Right. Uh, we have a premise in Shinkage in particular is that uh, training, the skill enhancement should be a workout and any working out you do should be skill enhancement at the same time. So I developed a, a series of workouts that involve the use of the weapons and the people who enjoy it the most, and it's hard work. I, you know, heart rates up in the peak areas, I mean, it, it sucks. But the, the interesting thing about it, and I've looked into the, the neural basis of it, but the interesting thing about it is everybody enjoys doing it. And I have a number of women who've never done anything martial in their lives. They've never shot a gun. They've never done this. I've got other women who are old time kickboxers, right? But I've got plenty of women who just, no, I'm not oriented towards that sort of thing. And we'll go through the weapons training and it's, you're hitting something. You're actually getting to physically right. strike something. Right. And they'll finish a rare, very hard workout, peak heart rates. They're sweating like crazy, having a rough time breathing and talking at the same time. and. Uh, there'll be a big smile on their face. And I'll say, okay, why are you smiling? That was really fun. Right. And I'm going, well, what's fun about swinging a sword at a target? And this one particular woman, you know, she, she just said, well, I, don't, I don't know why, it's just primal. And I said, you're absolutely right. And it turns out there is actually neural science studies that have shown anything where you're facing adversity stimulates a, 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 a essentially it pushes down the amygdala's tension tendency to push fear so you're facing a somewhat fearful situation even if it's only within your own mind the amygdala can be pressured down and it, that'll suppress the emotion of fear and when you do that during a tough physical exercise and you're leaning into, let's say, leaning into the threat or the resistance, it stimulates dopamine. So you're at the same time that you're lowering your own fear of what you're doing, you're increasing a stimulant that gives you pleasure at doing it. And they have found this basically applies to all mammals, whether they're predators or not predators. But anytime you see a rat stand up to a cat, that's exactly what's happening what, with that rat, and that's why it'll keep going on. The rat that turns and runs, that's there too. That's the fight or flight, right. and it's, it's selected flight. Right. But you'll often see that rat, other rat turn forward and fight against the cat and chase it off. And humans have that same capacity, and it used to be we took full advantage of it. If we had a weapon, we knew we had a chance to stand in and lean into that friction. Right. Without a weapon, we don't have much of that chance. Right. There's a, a great video I'll show in lectures. I might have shown it on the one I did in Japan. We call it taking meat from lions. I, and you've seen I've that. Seen All it, right. Yeah. So the point on that, again, is these guys, the reason they're willing to do that, they're carrying weapons. They don't need to use the weapons. They don't use the weapons. In fact, the weapons they have, which are very you know, weak hunting bows for small game, wouldn't stop a lion by right. any means. But it's the demeanor that weapon provides it allows them the steadfast of mind to walk down the slope to the where the lions are lions are going up and going what the hell is going on here they take off of the bushes these three guys the oldest of which was 65 by the way right cut cut the meat off the the wildebeest and walk off so, you know, you say that I saw I've seen it in law enforcement. So as a transit, an original transit police officer, we worked alone. Yeah. So it was really the last department that did solo patrol. Right. 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 You're down in a hostile environment, the New York City subway system. So just the environment's dangerous. Right. right? And, you know, I would I would rot, pull into a, a station. I'd see a cop dealing with a couple of guys and I could I'd see and I'd see the cop. Was kind of too much. Yeah. Backing off. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm getting all, jumping off the train to go and, you know, and you see the you see the difference where the the, guy, the cop who is like very like he seems like he's right. not the guy you want to right. mess with. Now the criminals are on their heels. Right. But if the, the cop, for whatever reason, kind of goes into himself a little bit and backs off, 
that almost feeds that energy oh, yeah. in yeah. the criminal. Is, yeah. you know? So it's kind of the same thing you're saying with these tribesmen that are able to push the lions back. Right. They're, they're pushing them back yeah. with their, for, I, their sheer force of will. I, I got yeah. hired to work for uh, doing consulting work up at uh, Washington State's Criminal Justice Training Center. Okay. So we were training law enforcement from different agencies around the area, and that's exactly what we're, we're working on was especially at that time Seattle was having a problem with uh, Russian mafia okay so you got you know relatively young Russian thugs who come from a totally different society right. environment very different do, right? they're a very different mindset yeah we got these we got boys coming out and girls right. and who've never been in a fist fight in their life and that what we essentially were advocating well one of the things I'm sure you've heard of the 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 Tuller rule from coming out of New York City about facing an, an armed knife man with a right, handgun right. you can't do anything under 21 feet right. well actually you can but right. they didn't approach it that way so what we worked with is presence of mind right always stepping offline always moving forward right and it was it was surprisingly effective. Now it wasn't something we invented. A couple of guys who worked with me. One of them's a Marine Corps Colonel who started me in the first place. Another one was a Seattle uh, cop. Same type of thing. He was former Marine, then went to Special Forces, then went okay. to law enforcement. But both of you know, we all three worked on what do we do with an officer? Because especially your, your your sheriff's departments are often solo officers in a patrol car and he's got back up 30 minutes away. And the last thing he can do is, well, he can sit in the car and wait until backup gets there or he can go out and approach the right. threat. And it, it's all demeanor, it's all mindset. And so for most of them, they, they catch on. And interestingly, uh, one of the biggest seminars I did up there, I had 300 cops in there a number of whom, of whom were old street cops. And I would pull a couple of the old guys out and I'd set up a scenario where they're facing some of the young guys. I'd have the young guys muscling in, muscling right. up. And I'd have the old guys one at a time face two or three of them and look and I'd have the rest of the people. So watch, watch the old guys' behavior. Young guy to young guy, it's always you and me, let's go. Right. Old cops, never fixes his eyes, he's always watching everything around him. And I said, what's that tell you? And well, of course they don't get it. And I'd ask him, why, why aren't you watching him? Well, I'm watching him. Why aren't you watching him directly? He's not my only problem. Right. Right. And that simple change of over-focusing on this threat here, when the general area is going to be a threat, you don't know until it's been fully assessed. And so when I graduated the NYPD Academy in uh, 88, um, the defensive tactics left a lot to be desired. I'd already been training for 10 years in karate and jiu-jitsu. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of, you're the same as the general public. Right. You're okay, I'm okay. Instead of saying, you guys are elite, you have to act a certain way, you have to behave a certain way, you have to be above the general public. So I graduate the NYPD Academy. Now I'm a police officer, but I'm in the transit police. There were three separate departments then. So now I go to the transit police academy for three weeks. Mm. So here I'm being told, you know, you're the same as the general public in the NYPD Academy. Now I get to the transit police academy and the first day the instructors go, okay, it's not the motorman's train. It's not the conductor's train. It's your train. It's your station. You run everything, you're the guy in yeah. charge. And all of a sudden, a very different mindset. The techniques they showed, which they did do defensive tactics techniques, were very different yeah. from the NYPD yeah. version. And part of it, I think, was because these, like what you're saying, these were not 20-something-year-old guys teaching these courses. Right, right, right. These were senior transit guys who had a lot of experience and know that you're going to be going out there patrolling solo. Right. right, right, right. It's not you and a partner in a car. It's not 10 guys showing up at the yeah, same scene. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's the nature of, you know, you've seen society, and, you know, this, this, the, the social justice demand, right. which is, you know, I, I can't say it's all bad for no. cops. I mean, right. c cops should be, I mean, it used to be, we always heard about 
there has to, they have to go through a psychological profiling. It, it seemed like that lasted maybe five or six years where they actually kept to it strongly. Right. And then the, you know, things bent quite a bit. Right now, I think it's probably one of the most dangerous times in my history for people to become a cop. I, I would agree. Not I agree. Not agree. Not my son, my son's a Phoenix police officer. Is he? Uh, He's already been in the shooting. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, yeah, 100%. It, it's crazy in that regard. But it's, uh, you know, I, I I have very little input with that. I actually have a couple of local police in here. Both are women. Okay. Um, and one of them's a 30 year retiree from San Jose PD. So okay. She, she's been through it all. Right. The other is two years on Sedona PD. Okay. But she's going to be good. She you know she's good now. But the point being is that the, we can't change society. I can't change society. What I'm trying to do is is get people to understand one this is okay these things are okay you don't have to live with it under your pillow you know it, it doesn't have to be your cross that you're going to lead the world with but the better you understand your potential capability with it and how much better it works when the, your neighbors use it as well all right and that kind of concept because yeah you know, I, I have no idea right now i used to do a lot of work with sedoni pd or a lot more work than i'm doing now uh, I have no idea what the response time is now. No clue. Right. I don't think they know what the response time is. And this is, you know, it's just the way things are right. going. The part, departments become very politicized, and it's the nature of the modern world. I'm in Maricopa right. County. Right, right. Okay, so. I'm in I'm in Whitman uh, three and a half years, and I think I've seen a Maricopa County car drive down my street. I don't think more than six yeah. times. Okay. And I, I, I'm assuming the response time would not be one that, I'm sure I would be all finished and done with whatever I was <laughs> right. dealing with, and they're just coming to take a report or do whatever, because if I, there's no right. way I can count on them right. to protect me right. or my family. Right. Yeah, which, well, and that, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing I think if it's a great people thing. are prepared. Right. But right. that's I the agree. problem, is that we don't have much encouragement for that pre preparation. Right. So it actually, it was just about halfway through the pandemic people are coming up and wanting to do, you know, they didn't know what they wanted to do. They knew they wanted to do something to learn how to protect themselves. And when I say people, predominantly women. And, you know, I'm trying to find out why, just because my, my, I've been working in research for 50 years, and it's the concept that you're always looking at. Why are people doing this on a societal basis, and particularly when you're looking at combative behavior? What is it that makes you think you're going to need to protect yourself? And, you know, it's nothing overt that you can point to. It's just a lot of subtleties. It's a making, feeling. Yeah, it's, people are very, you know, unnerved by what's right. going on. Right, 100%. There. So, yeah. So, you, know? Yeah. Uh, you know, we what we did in New York was when COVID hit, obviously, the New York governor shut everything down. Right. We, we shut down the dojo. And I had a storefront dojo there. It was open seven days a week. We shut down the dojo for about... Uh, 10 days right and then i ran into our town police commissioner and i said i'm just letting you know i'm opening back up and he yeah. says do whatever you want we had our own separate government it was right. incorporated village he says you do whatever you want and, you know we had people i would look look in and be like shaking their heads they all right. got the masks on right. rural training no masks right and uh you know we've seen an uptick in people wanting to more, learn more about real fighting sure. as opposed to like nobody walks into my, the new york school i had which is still being run by one of my guys or my little school here in whitman and walks in and says hey um i want to be a tournament champion yeah right, right, right. um they, they could walk in and say you know what you know you know what how do you train what do you, i want to learn how to defend myself and uh, so I, I agree with you on that there's been a little bit of a change in that regard and i think part of it is uh, like i explained to people one time in new york you know you keep attacking society's protectors society's protectors don't have to protect you they don't have to go out of their no. way they wear the bulletproof vests they have the guns they can kind of close ranks and say we'll take reports but we're not going to actively go yeah. out there yeah. looking to fight crime and and i said when if you keep attacking them attacking them well when you're on your own you really can't complain right and now i think the people at are not the people that are attacking the police, but the people that are feeling that. They're feeling like, well, my happened. God, I, I don't know. I, I've got to be able to protect myself. I can't just count yeah. on law enforcement. When you have the powers of be demanding that the police department act more as a social welfare agency, right. and you know, at the same time, police are 
you know, I, this started years ago where the police were saying, well, we, we don't have to legally, we don't have to protect you. Right. And, right. and wait, that's what I thought you were for. Right. <laughs> right. And that, right. well, if you're not going to protect me, then, and, you know, it's, it's frankly, it's pretty weak for the police then to say, well, you should learn how to, to protect yourself. Well, right. yeah, but that, how do I do that? Yeah, so I'm not even saying that it's a, it's, a, it's a thing where they're getting together and formulating that. I just think it's a human nature thing. When you have the upper echelon of a police department not backing your actions. No, well, that, that's your, my point. Your politicians that's who, that's aren't who, backing the actions. And, and they're pushing. That's and now a, guy's, a, guy, a cop's not only afraid of losing his job, he's afraid that he's going to be prosecuted. Yeah, well, and you've, you, I think, I'm sure I, I've seen it locally, but you know, I'm hearing from my former colleagues up in Washington and L.A. and whatnot, is it's only been three years since, let's say, the pandemic hit right. its peak. Or let's say since the Floyd situation right, right, started. Right. So we've already got a new, we got a new generation of cops in there, a right. totally different cop than we right. were expecting before. Right. So it's, and I remember what, just prior to the, uh, just prior to the whole Floyd breakup and that sort of stuff that was going on, on a, a senior officer up in Washington was telling me, he says, we're looking forward to getting the Afghan vets in. Because this was going to be, you know, this is like after Vietnam, we got these hardcore guys who've been through the shit, and they're going to be good. The shooting my son was in. Yeah. Had a new, newer, newer guy with him. My yeah. son was still wasn't on the department that long. The guy that was with him was what? He was a vet. Oh, that right. had been over there. Yeah. That the department had hired recently yeah. in Phoenix. So my son, my son had said to me, he says that you know when I was with that guy, I knew that. I know he didn't have a lot of law enforcement experience, but I knew yeah. he had been in bad, bad situations. Right, right, so there was right. a confidence level there yeah. when we got out and faced the guy yeah. that I wasn't, it wasn't just yeah, me. Yeah, sure, I, I could, I, that's you know, a, a huge factor yeah. too. I mean, but that's, but it's not what happened. All the, all of these guys you, coming you, back you, and you. saying, last thing I want to do is go right, be a cop. Right, now. exactly, yeah, so, right. Yeah. Well, we saw a change in the NYPD when they did away with the, uh, when they made it that you had to have a college degree. So we started. I, I remember reading that. I so, was curious so about we started that. Seeing, yeah. What we started seeing happening is, and I had a, an associate's degree, so I don't have, uh, you know, I just have an associate's degree. Um, so what we started seeing was, you know, a guy who graduated high school whose dream was to be a cop. I want to be a cop. Mm -hmm. I want to go out there and help people, protect people. That's All what right. I want to do. Okay, now he's got to go to college, right? So then what started happening is you're getting guys that got these college degrees that they can't get jobs with. All right. And now they're like, what am I going to do? How am I going to earn a living? New York had become much safer. Giuliani, Bloomberg, yeah, yeah. lot safer, right? So now they joined the department, but they never really wanted to be in law enforcement. Right. right. They're doing it because... It was a because, second choice because they couldn't get anything else. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And no, I, so yeah. you saw a dramatic change in, you know, so what was going on, you know? So, uh, you know, and again, though, now they're, they're not gonna reverse that though. They're not gonna say, oh, you don't have to have a college degree or you don't have to do this, you know? So, uh, you know, it's just interesting how that's going on with, with modern law it's, enforcement it's, right now. It's, and unfortunately, it's, it's, it's global. I do a fair amount of work in Australia as well. Okay. Uh, worked with the Australian Defense Force, same thing, the commando unit. Okay. And couple of the guys who train in Chicago with me are uh, federal law enforcement guys. Okay. And literally during the pandemic, I watched these departments slide downhill so incredibly fast. Primarily uh, two major cities. Uh, just borderline uh, fascist. I mean, just incredibly. Right. Right. And I'm going, what the hell is going on? One of, one of my best people is actually a, a federal law enforcement officer in the capital city. Be like being a federal cop in DC. Right. Except it's a much nicer city. Right. Well, I said, what the hell is going on? He says, and he he said, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I said, because nobody wants to talk about it. You know, right. if their agency's still halfway clean, they're embarrassed by what's going on. Right. I mean, they were right. thugs. These guys turned into thugs. Well, my, th my son and I talked about uh, it. Because you saw some of it even here. Yep. And my son was like, what are these guys thinking? 
Now, again, my son grew up in the dojo that had a ton of law enforcement. Right, right. So he's been exposed to me. Obviously, I'm his father, right? But he's like, how could a, how could a police officer think it's okay to treat somebody like that? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I still think the majority of American cops wouldn't go the way the Australian cops or the Canadian cops for that. Yeah, matter. I don't think they would either. I don't think they would. But it still shocked the hell out of me because I knew a lot of those Australian cops. And I'm, you know, I, I'm going, damn, what the hell is going well, on? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. We had a new captain get promoted and he's addressing our roll call. And he's telling us to do something particular um, that's 100% violating your constitutional rights. So, you know, I, excuse me, Captain, um, you're asking us to violate the yeah. United States Constitution. Right. We can't do that. I'm telling you, this is what he's telling me, right? I'm telling you, you're going to do this. The lieutenant standing behind him who'd been in Vietnam, he's behind him. The captain can't see him yeah. and the lieutenant's going like this. <laughs> like, in other words, don't pay any attention to this guy, right? So the roll call ends. We talk to the lieutenant. The lieutenant says, listen, I'm going in his office right now. I'm going to straighten him out. You guys don't pay any attention. Yeah, and, yeah. But again, this is what happens sometimes. You get a guy in a position where all of a sudden he thinks he has powers that he yeah. really doesn't no, well, have. That, that's it. It's the nature of law enforcement in particular is it's not a military association, no. but we tend to think of it as a, you know, similar to a military like corporate say body. Like paramilitary right, right, right. or something like that. Right. But it, it's a totally different corporate body mindset. And the American military... The Marine Corps, in particular, I know pretty well. You you got you know you got your share of douchebags as well, but right. the, for the most part, those guys are going to stand up for what their constitution says we're supposed to right. be doing. Right. And their leadership understands that. Right. So they you know some colonel who's playing politics knows how far he can push illegal politics before his junior command is saying, "Sir, we're not we're not doing that." Right. And the nature, I think, of the military tends to be, not all the time, mind you, because it, it, it goes in cultural ways right. as well, is a little bit more steadfast up until very recently than law enforcement in general. Because right. law enforcement, because you can see a huge changeover in just two year period oh, with the department. 100%. But now we're seeing you know the, the DEI thing in the military. Marines aren't doing it. Right. Army's done it. Navy's done it. Air Force has done it. And it's already impacting combat capability in combat arms in the Army. It's already impacted the Marine Corps as far as that goes. We're at the lowest combat capability in 60 years. And, yeah, you're going, how, how, how well, are we, we saw We saw the same thing in law enforcement. So we saw, you know, you're doing the run every day in the gym. I'm doing it every day never dropped out once. You saw the same people drop yeah. out. Now this is an 88. Yeah. People are dropping out every day. And what are we being told by the instructors? They're not going to graduate. They're not going to graduate. Right, right, right. Who was standing right next to me at graduation? Yeah, he was rough. All the people yeah. that, that, couldn't, yeah. that couldn't complete the run, that yeah. couldn't do a lot of physical stuff. Now those people are on the street. And it's not just females. It's, it's guys too yeah. that are physically yeah. weak, yeah. that never thought about you know, doing any type of physical activity. Yeah. And, and now you're working with them and, and you observe it, you know, you were, whether it's that they're holding a gun in a limp wristed fashion, we're like, oh my God, like, what are we doing here? So you see a lowering of standards. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, to me, I see the same exact thing going on in martial arts, bringing it back to that, which is, I see too many people that are content to be mediocre. They get to a certain point and they're like, okay, I've got it. I don't have to train anymore. Um, you know, in Okinawa, I spoke to a, a, an Okinawan karate sensei a few years ago who's 90, and I asked him, what's the difference between karate now and karate when you started? He said, when I started, we were taught that when you put your hand on the doorknob to leave the house, you had to be ready. He says, now on Okinawa, if your students don't do well at tournaments, your karate sucks, right? right, right, right? right. So he says, Okinawa's got, got a problem, right? And I look at the Japanese koru. I have video on my channel from the 1970s mm. of demonstrations of Japanese koru at the Budokan. You see the intensity, you see the intent in the attacks. And now you see those same, some of those same Ru demonstrating now, right. and it's literally just, um, there's no intensity in the attack. 
Right. And I'm not even saying you have to practice to the point where, you know, you're trying to really kill the guy. But there has to be an intent where you're trying to actually right. hit him, or, you no, know, strike him with that weapon. That, that, and that's you know? what that's what Cody is supposed to be. Right. And there's, um, I, 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 you know, I've been watching it since what 70, 75. And I've seen it, the Shinda Musa, it was my first real introduction to politics taking over and we're going to change the kata to suit this particular group, whatever. Karate was even prior to that, man. I mean, we went political long before long any of before. that. The Koryu, the, 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 let's say the family nature of the Koryu has uh, maintained better, let's say, than when you have organizations, international organizations, localized organizations. Uh, I was. I remember when I first went to a uh, a grading competition for Shindo Musa Ryu, and they all wearing the patches with their ranks, their names, and their the dojo. On okay. It. So they wear it tip pin to their keikogi. Okay. So you got a thousand people in there. Now, why does anybody need to know your name, your rank in Jodo, and what dojo you're from? Because Japan's a very socially hierarchical society. One hundred percent. Everybody's got to know exactly where they stand right. in regard to everybody else. Right. And I had never seen that before. Yeah. So I started again like in '75, and th this is the Kendo organization that was doing that. Right. That's the right. one I had tested right. in well, Jodo, and because it's it's interesting you said that because when I tested in Jodo, all I wore was a number. Well, that's because you're coming from the outside into the group. So okay. you have all the local groups. Let's say uh, you have in, in Tokyo alone, I think they got something like 200 and some odd Jodo dojos or groups okay. who were sanctioned for, for teaching Jodo. Okay. Most of what they do is not what Shimizu Sensei would have called Shindo Musu Jo. Right. It's what Kendo Renmei Jodo. Calls Jodo. Right. So, and the. Yeah, I, at different times, I was offered different ranks in the Kendo Renmei, and I'd, I always declined it. Well, you don't really need to do anything. You don't need to test anything because I, I was known well enough as being a protege of Drager, and then later on, I was in these other groups. And we just want you to have the rank. wasn't for my benefit. It was for, for them benefit. to, yeah, yeah, so they could claim that sort of thing. So this kind of stuff where your name, rank, serial number, and, and <laughs> right. the village you belong to right. kind of thing was out there. That's that's pretty much a Japanese style. The old code, you didn't do anything like that. We have this, uh, there's, there's no such thing as, let's say, a hombu dojo and branch dojos in different cities. And there's no such thing as this branch sensei and that branch sensei and this branch sensei. Now, that, that's old style. Right. So my teacher is my teacher. My teacher is not the teacher of my students. Right. And this, this is, a, is a big distinction in the Kodiu mindset. But it's filtering down through the Kodiu systems as well. Right. As if, you know, Soke so-and-so has six Swiss, French, and Italian branch dojo. I guarantee you, Soke so and so's teacher would be rolling in his grave when he heard that. Because, no, he doesn't. Right. If he didn't teach those people, right, they're not his students. Right. And that concept of responsibility, you have, you know, it, it's best described. I always thought that connection with your teachers and your fellow students is a web. The teachers are more or less at the center of the web. Right. But there's a connection from everybody to everybody else in that web. And it's not a top-down hierarchical web. Right. It's a web that says, okay, here's the teacher, his responsibilities are to every other student in there. He doesn't have web connections to the student of one of his students. And right. it doesn't keep on going down that way. But if you watch it, look in Japanese texts on tracing, for example, Shinkage lineage or Shinto view lineage, you'll see these hierarchical charts go in all sorts of different directions. Right. None of that's valid in the classical Japanese context. Okay. And that's one of those things where, yeah, my teacher, my grand teacher is, yeah, no. Your teacher is the guy that taught you. Right. 
and your student is the guy that you're teaching. Right. And you can have, let's say, for example, when I, when I started, I was given per permission to teach to a certain level. After I'd spent a certain amount of time, I moved back to the States, I was moving to Hawaii, and Concha Sensei took me aside and said, okay, you can teach this, this, and this. And, you know, I, I kind of understood it, because Drager had beat it into my head years prior. And I said, okay, so, uh, what's that mean? That means these people are members of the Shinkage tradition and you're their teacher. All right. But you're only allowed to teach this, this, and this. I said, okay, that's, I got it. And then they all wanted to go meet Kancho Sensei in Japan. Right. I said, okay. I contacted Kancho Sensei. I said, my students would like to come and meet you. And he, he was a very proper guy. So he had one of the other seniors write back to me and say, Kancho Sensei is very happy to meet your students. Uh, and it was apparent Kancho Sensei had told him to ask me. He says, are they expecting to train under Kancho Sensei? And I said, absolutely not. They're my students. Not in the possessive manner, right. but they are right. my responsibility. Right. Right. They're not his responsibility. Right. So when we got there, every one of them was invited to train, but they're just visiting training. Right? Right. So, and I had explained that all to them, but this was, this was an important distinction because right. what's being passed on in the Koryu is life or death. So, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because I've, I've, I've never heard it put that way, but... <clears throat> So I've been to Okinawa several times. Uh, my sensei, Kichino Shimbuku, is the current Soke, he's the, the founder's son. Um, one year I went and I had a couple of students that I had asked him, would it be possible for them to, to grade in Okinawa? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking purely from, it would just be nice for them to do it at the Hambu right. in Okinawa. And he told me no. Yeah. And now you mentioning, right. you explaining this, now makes me rethink and say, he was, he was in a roundabout way, not coming right out and saying it. He was basically telling me, they're your responsibility, yep. you promote them. Right, right. Now that, it, you know, we, we have, because you know, we're a society that tends to think like modern karate, judo, and aikido is Japan the same way, is we have black belt rankings. Right. Which is, is the dojo organization where we have branch dojos and homo dojo and everybody well, can be part of that same group. So even in my own dojo, like people get promoted and I tell them, I go, listen, this rank stuff, these Don grades, they only matter in our, our dojo here. Right. It, it, it's just me telling you, giving you the pat on the back right. saying, right. hey, you've been training really hard. I appreciate right. what you're doing. Okay, now you're, you get, you're ready for show. And that, it, it, that, that makes perfect sense. And the Japanese do that as well right. because they're, they're very good at that. I mean, they, until Kano and, the, and Judo actually formulated, there was no, the no Don no, ranking. No, no Don ranks. But like this, this art tradition here, it's a family tradition. I had to be brought into the family right. to be ranked. My son was brought into the family to be ranked. My daughter will be brought into the family to be ranked. Right. I don't have, none of us have the authority then, to, we have a new, a new Soke who's uh, and he, he and I are very are close, so I know exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it. But none of us, my son, my daughter, myself, are interested in, uh, let's say, we, we, we were literally adopted into the Fujiwara clan okay. to be, to be the, receive the rank. I don't have the family authority to invite somebody into the Fujiwara clan. Right. So it's a family thing. It's very much a family. Thing. Right. And there's nobody that I can, let's say, authorize to go to Japan. That's purely between them and going back to that thing. Right. Which, you know, when I first heard about that, you know, when I was first working with Drager, he, he was trying to explain to me the differences between the Koryu approach and the modern right. Gendai Budo approach is, you know, we can have branch dojos, and if you're you're a sandan in this dojo, you'll be recognized as a sandan in that dojo. Right. And okay, that kind of make that's the American way, that's the right. Western way. It makes sense, it's logical. But right. this thing is once it becomes a family. You remember the movie Shane? 
Sure. Okay. So sure. Uh, nobody knows Shane anymore. In my mind, I grew up on Shane. Alan Ladd, Jack Plant, right, yeah, classic. Yeah, scene. It's, it, and here's, in my mind, when I went off to you know study martial arts around the world, in my mind, I was Shane the Lone Gunman. I'm more than willing, you know, I'll, I'll help the village, you know, right. fight off the bad guys, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm still that lone gunman. And Drager started explaining to me at the ripe age of 23, 24, that uh, it's not about you anymore. Right. It's about the your relationship to the tradition. And I remember thinking, wow, that's that's pretty heavy. And thinking to myself, I'm still the I'm still Shane. I'm still the one. <laughs> and then over the next twenty years, I got sucked deeper and deeper into it. Until in spite of my image, it's still Shane getting on that horse, although it's a bigger problem now than it's ever been before, <laughs> right? Is that I have a, a, a responsibility, obligation to a, a 400, 500 year old Japanese tradition that has become a familial, a family related obligation that, you know, it's, you can't explain it to anybody else. It's just, you know, okay, no, you, you, we don't have a Don ranking for you. you know, it's just not there. And we have, you know, you'll, you'll see the, the Nafutakake, the board up there is organized. Not, those aren't ranking setups. Those are actually seniority, seniority positions. When yeah. people started. Right. When they started, started training. where they are more or less in the syllabus has nothing to do with being authorized for wearing this on your belt or anything else along that. So I trained in Sosui Shitsuru Jiu Jitsu, which is Koro out of Fukuoka. Right. That's about a almost 400 tradition. Right. Uh, unbroken line within the Shitama family. Um, it's not in very good shape. Right. in terms of is it going to survive into the future right um i'm hoping it does i'm trying to make it that it does but um you know and it's kind of the same situation i feel this responsibility to try to do something that it survives beyond me i do have the whole curriculum right the headmaster taught it um but there's no like real serious classes being no. taught in Fukuoka. So that's a problem. That, and, that's and, all of Japan. Yeah, like and, that, and, right. and that's one of the things I'm seeing. So I can understand when someone like uh, Sugino Sensei issues Don grades in Katori. Um, I understand where he's coming from. Um, but, you know, I, I think they're also, especially when, you know, I'm not in the position that I'm the headmaster. Right. But if you're the headmaster and you're responsible for this art to survive, you want to make sure it survives and there's pressures on you that a guy like me i can't understand those pressures right so i understand when they try to make or adapt to ways where maybe they can help the art to survive and i get it and part of the problem is is most japanese aren't interested in studying no, these no. arts anymore. well that's 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 the nature of japan and the culture they're, and they're all going through that that uh I was not intimately connected to Katori, but because I was with Gregor as you know, his protege, um, with Otake Sensei's branch and the, the trials and tribulations they've gone through, he Gregor was the one that kept Otake from opening it up in general to foreigners prior to his death. Once he passed away. It bloomed like a what a rotten right. flower is the only way I can describe right. it. Right. And unfortunately, quite a number of the people who became outside sensei in California, Italy, I know one in uh, Amsterdam, I think it is, are about as corrupt as you could hope for. I, I think and, you see that. I think we could probably say that about every art. Well, they're, or, they're, or, they're all they're all going to have. There, there's there, in my mind, for example, there's absolutely no reason why anybody should want to take one of these traditions and market it in America or Italy or Rome or wherever else. There's absolutely nothing there right. for the average person. Right. There's nothing there. So it's it's anybody who has taken it and is trying to make it a marketable a viable product is doing something that the Japanese have allowed him to do in the first place. Right. 
and are, apparently have continued to allow them to do well. And even some Japanese are doing. Oh yeah, well yeah, that too. They're doing. That, that's why I say they're they're yeah. ultimately irresponsible. But my my real point is, if you're maintaining this as uh, a Kōryu Buddhist, a true Kōryu Buddhist. It's not for everybody. Oh, 100%. And this, and this is this is the hardest thing to get across to 100%. people. 100%. So it's... Go outside. Go outside. I appreciate you sitting uh, down It was my pleasure. This. I enjoyed um, the talk. I learned a lot, which is one of the things I'm finding when I do any of these interviews. Um, I'm a little selfish. I do them really <sighs> more for me. And if people watch them and like them, great. Um, I just really appreciate you doing this. No, I, I enjoy, appreciate no. it a lot. I'm glad I finally got to meet you. I've been aware of you for a very, very <laughs> long time, um, but I'm glad I got to meet yeah. you, and I just want to say thanks again. Well, I hope you can make it up again sometime. Yeah, and, definitely. I definitely like to come You're up welcome here. anytime. All right. Uh, good luck with, with your reaching out to the world, because, you know, they definitely need the information. Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks. So. so I really appreciate it. Good. Thanks. My pleasure.